challenges of structural failure. Um, we are very lucky to have yet more outstanding speakers. Uh, the next one is Ed Morton uh, of the uh, originally named Morton Partnership. Um, extraordinary CV, really, in connections. Prestigious roles as engineer to Canterbury Cathedral, York Minster, Westminster Abbey, currently also working as a Paul's Cathedral. Uh, involved in projects as diverse as the Palace of Westminster and uh, Abbey Park and Leicester, which is obviously the, the most important of all of those projects. Um, means obviously Ed brings a, a really great insight for operating at very local projects but across the country and some really significant ones. Also, as a principal contributor to English Heritage's Practical Building Conservation Series and uh, a regular lecture uh, on the scene. So, without further ado. Thank you, Justin, and I uh, hope you're all refreshed and rearing to go after that short break. Um, so, I'm going to talk about big and small projects uh, in a way, and some of the sort of principles and philosophy of I, that I get involved with, and I call it the art of the possible. Um, but firstly, just to say, I would just finish that, but I really put it up just to talk about care, so the Conservation Accreditation Register mm -hmm. for Engineers. Please go to the website. I'm not going to say any more because Jess is going to talk about that a little bit. And what may care lead you to? Well, projects like the uh, rebuilding of the parapets at Durham Cathedral, uh, Canterbury Cathedral, where I've been working for about 20 years, but then to slightly more bizarre things, like the Grade 1 listed 1854 statues of dinosaurs in Crystal Palace Park and helping putting the wings back on Concord. So it's really remarkable where it can lead. Um, on uh, one side here we've got Guyana, um, which is a colonial building in South America I've been out to help look at. And Zaki might recognise the one on the right, uh, which is actually mosaics in Cyprus, where we've just been looking at the options for oversheltering for the Getty Conservation Institute. And then just a, a few oddity projects. This is um, a building that was in the way of the high-speed rail link um, at the back of King's Cross. And we were asked to look at uh, whether we could help take it down brick by brick and rebuild it. And we said, well, we're not really convinced by that. So we said, can we move it as a whole building? Much more fun. <laughs> 370 tonnes of it. And we did find a site, and we were going to put it in. Unfortunately, we couldn't find out who owned the site. So um, we had to move it elsewhere. Unfortunately, 370 tonnes, it would have disappeared into some tube tunnels. So we had to cut it into horizontal slices, uh, pick it up, stick it on the back of a lorry, trundle it down the road, and then stack it up again. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Um, and there we are at the end of it. So green and um, uh, on uh, by the Camden Lock action. Uh, here are a slightly different type of disaster, and this is St Ethelburg's Church in the City of London, which was uh, unfortunately uh, bomb damaged in the 1993 attack. And this is part of the work in rebuilding it, and this is rebuilding a rubble core wall. But on the right, you can actually see that we didn't try to replicate everything. We actually tried to show where some of the new work was and where some of the old work was. The roof was completely gone, so we put steel trusses in, in a sort of, not facsimile, but just so it gave you the gist of what was there. And here's the tower arch where we tried to reuse as many of the stones as possible. It all came down and had to be assessed on the ground. But now this is a, a centre for reconciliation, peace and reconciliation. So they're not trying to hide their story, they want to actually tell their story of what's happened to them and how they've actually resurrected themselves from this terrible, terrible um, uh, consequence. But actually, as a structural engineer, you get as much of an enjoyment of doing these lovely little projects. This is a cursed edge bake house um, in Essex, and I got asked to go and look at it because the builder had said the fireplace, the uh, uh, inside, had to come down. And the owner wasn't quite convinced about that. And actually, we didn't need to. It didn't really need very much work. So for a couple of hundred pounds, I was able to go out there and actually give advice, and that is, can be as satisfying as doing a major, major project. She was very happy, and actually the builder learned a bit as well. Uh, a leaning gateway, and this really did leave. Um, this is Moses Priory in Essex, 
You can see the uh, big uh, metal straps at the top coming down, which were restraining it, stopping it fall over. Been on the heritage uh, risk, risk register for a long time. You can see the way these buttresses at the back, that's a metal rod uh, a column which actually supports the top of the um, uh, gateway. And it's actually, on the right, you can see the pintles from the old door. And it was the pintles corroding slowly, a number of pintles, which was jacking the face of it up and causing the lean. So what do you do about that? Well, we opened up the joint where the movement was, put some wooden wedges in, and then took the pintles out and slowly pushed it back took the wedges out and it went back into upright. Really satisfying because the owner said it's not going to work, it's going to fall down. But it didn't in this area, it's, it's just a lovely little, um, and it's actually common sense. There wasn't a lot of engineering involved, it's certainly no calculations. <laughs> um, so it's uh, almost uh, always possible to repair and reuse historic buildings and structures, but it depends on significance, Understanding what you've got, both historically and actually how it's put together. Viable use, of course, really important. Money, <coughs> some of that. Not always a lot. And determination. And I think that determination and will to do something is really, really critical. Doesn't mean you can save everything. Um, and this is a wall that was hit by flood damage. But really, only so that I can tell you the story of me arriving on site knocking on the door with a respectable tweed jacket gentleman of the manor opening the door saying, are you with me or with the enemy? <laughs> and I said, well, who's the enemy? And he goes, the insurance company. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm with you. He goes, good, whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a barn in slightly seen better days, it has to be said. Um, but we did manage to save it. And there we are, finished. Actually, I think a little bit too straight. Uh, this is what the client wanted, you know, I would have made it a little bit more wonky, I think. does bring me on to a point, though, that I think as a conservation engineer, we also have a very important role in educating other engineers, I hope. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about a project uh, uh, that Mike uh, Brown has sort of mentioned my name. Basically a barn conversion where an engineer wanted to remove all the rafters, and he also wanted to put some stabilising frames inside. Um, and Mike sort of said, okay, actually, I want somebody to, a uh, care engineer, to have a look at this. So by the time he got to me, I think Mike had scared the engineer already because they'd already agreed the rafters could be retained. Um, but then I talked to the engineer. I said, so why, why do you want to put these frames in? He goes, well, wind resistance. I said, so has not the building been there for a couple of hundred years? Has it blown over? And he goes, no. I said, well, I've never done any calculations on wind resistance in a building that's been there that long. And he sort of thought about it, and he's now sent me a packet of information, taking those frames out, and just accepting the principle, it's been there a long time, it's worked, why change it? So I think that education is an important thing for conservation engineers. Of course, you do get ones which are much more badly damaged. This is all sent to West Dunwich, Grade 1 listed church. And again, the roof has gone completely, so we didn't try to replicate it. We put something new and fit for purpose for the 21st century, Rather nice on the right hand side there to use some of the child timbers to form a cross. Uh, one uh, with Heritage Lincolnshire, who were outside on a stand. Um, this really was uh, in poor condition. You could hardly get inside the building for the amount of scaffold inside. It was just absolutely littered with it. See quite significant movement um, through the windows, decayed structure everywhere, and that's it finished. And yes, it was hard work, and we had a contractor who wasn't used to doing conservation, but was prepared to learn. And there were some challenges. We got rid of a single-storey extension, but then put a stair tower in um, to provide access to all levels. And here we are finished, and in reuse. So it's amazing what can be done with the right will. Why do these buildings actually, are we able to do this? Well, they're incredibly flexible, actually. They're really tolerant. Mainly, actually, people. But here's the bus that hits it, hit this building. We had one cracked timber and one pane of glass, and that was it. And I think that really does tell you how incredibly tolerant they are. Compliance with modern regulation, this one doesn't. It's still there, though. And calculations, are they useful or not? So this, this wall has a factor of safety of less than one, so it shouldn't be there. 
You just see very a line there. So there used to be a shed against it. You think, great, a nice little buttress to support this wall. In the 87 gales, the shed got blown up, the gable stayed there. So there's interesting discussions about liability and insurance and whatever, but basically said to the National Trust, why do you keep it consolidated? There's no reason it shouldn't survive. We did look at the risk, if it did fail, who would be hurt, and it's mainly cows. So a few future challenges, and it's something that Zaki mentioned as well, but climate change. And we are getting bigger winds, and this is a sort of fairly dramatic top of a, a spa, which got physically picked up and moved sideways. And uh, here's a roof to a church in Lincolnshire, uh, where a, a mini tornado went through. It's a rather Gaudi-esque style roof now. But rainfall as well. I mean, it's a big issue. Certainly, uh, this is Canterbury Cathedral, <coughs> the drains. It no longer can cope with the rainfall that we're having these sudden huge deluges, and they just don't work. So we're having to think about secondary systems or improved drainage. Thermal changes, so greater heat. Um, here's a lump of stone that fell off the Great South Window of Canterbury, and uh, it was caused, it happened on the day when it was very hot. There's these metal tie bars running through at each um, transom level, which we think expanded, although there's some corrosion as well. And ground movements, uh, the longer, drier periods that we are having. Um, uh, last uh, September, October, at the end of the very dry summer, I think I went to about 30 churches which had moved. But we should remember that actually sometimes it's happened in the past as well. And you see some unusual things and things you can't uh, really uh, believe. This is a rather wonderful church in Kent. These are the oil uh, trusses. That's one timber. And there's 24 of them in that church. And I had to do a double take and actually really go back and say, there must be a joint here somewhere, but there wasn't. Uh, local knowledge. Um, anybody know what's caused that? It's, of course, the 1884 Great Earthquake in Essex. Now, if you don't know about that and you're going to visit buildings in that area, then you can misunderstand the signs of movement, etc. So local knowledge, talk to people. Um, a case in Norwich we looked at a few years ago, not a very good slide, I'm uh, afraid, but you can see the roof is slightly above floor level, so it's going to push out on the walls. So the city engineer's solution uh, was the, the steel work that you can see in there, but you can't use the space anymore, which is pretty hopeless. Those plywood gussets at the back is our solution. So connecting the roof to the floor, then all the steel work goes. And it's common sense, it's easy, it's simple. It didn't require calculations. I said it again, didn't I? Um, short case study for a, um, a rather unusual structure, which was in structurally very bad condition. The Hermitage, we don't actually know what it is and why it was built uh, at Braxton Park. We know it was there in 1822. Um, and we have this rather unusual plan where we've got a brick dome in the middle, a vault running around the outside, and this is a little terrace uh, um, onto the lake. And that's the dome on the inside. Not great condition. See some of the signs of major cracking. The Yorkstone lintels between the pillars, some of them not supported. And here's on the outside. It had a great big iron strap around the outside of the barrel to actually stop all those thrusting forces. But of course that had corroded and it had gone. So everything was just relaxing, pushing outwards. And here again some of the images of the cracks. So it's pretty significant and um, you know it was a bit of a head scratcher. Distorted all over the place. So what do you do? Well um, you want to do as little as possible obviously. And how to fund? Well this one was funded by Historic England Grant and uh, it was topped up by a Country Houses Foundation grant as well. First thing, treasury work, so we actually restrained around the barrel to stop it going any further. We then took off the York stone slabs over the top of it, and this revealed the rather fantastic vaulting. Uh, must have been a master bricklayer who did this, I think. Um, had a small oculus right in the middle. The tree roots growing through some of it, had bats, of course. 
um, and then just a little diagram. So we put a new restraint strap around it um, to provide that resistance to the thrust. And there we are repairing the brickwork slowly. There's our back bricks that we had to put in. But we didn't try to correct any of that distortion. So we just actually stabilised it in its current position. And there's no way you could get it back. We did put the occasional stainless steel flat plates in under some of the York stone lintels. There's a view up, and again, you can see the distortion on the right hand side, and the little holes at the top are per pen switch have been left open for, yes, you can get it, bats. And this is the uh, exterior um, of it uh, repaired. Again, we haven't tried to push anything back, we've just stabilised it where it is. And so we still don't know what it is. How are you doing, Justin? Nearly, okay. Um, so I've only got a few more, and this is Willerton Hall, and I, I wanted to show this first because it's in Nottingham. It's a rather fantastic building, um, uh, 1580, by uh, uh, the architects uh, Smithson, who also did Hardwick Hall, Long Lit, did it for Sir Francis Willoughby, who was the owner of a very rich coal merchant, um, rather fantastic building, and this is the prospect room at the top which does have a floor in uh, just above the windows to the Great Hall. And inside we have a Chinese lattice floor. So this is a floor structure where none of the beams actually meets clear span across. So they sort of chase each other around the room a little bit. And why did they do that? Well, it's a 10 metre span. So actually, could you find timber switch long enough? Possibly not. Or was it actually that Sebastian Serlio had written a book in 1545, um, Italian architect, arrived in England in 1566, and it's got a Chinese lattice in. So was it the architect saying to the client, saying, oh, this will be fun, can you do one of these? <laughs> or was it the client saying to the architect, I want one of these, it's in my book? We don't know. But what happened in the 1950s, it was used by the Canadians during the war, um, and in the 1950s, um, the floor was condemned. The surveyor went in there and said, it's got to come out. It's in such a poor condition. Luckily, they didn't. Um, uh, but they did put these steel trusses in over the top, which means the prospect room has not been used for 50 years. Uh, below on the right is the Great Hall, which is immediately below it. You can see the hammer beam trusses, but they're non-structural. They're all just boarding. And it doesn't physically connect with the, uh, the floor above. So that uh, Chinese lattice floor is completely independent of this great hall. A level survey, where we had about 230 millimetres of deflection, and rather decayed beams as well, as you can see. But importantly, on the right hand side, it had been re levelled, and through the historic research, um, uh, it was found that it was by uh, Whiteville in about 1830 from memory. And those furrows were actually reasonably <coughs> level. So remember that. So what was the solution? We put some little angle brackets between the beam connections. So all those beam connections had opened up a little bit and it all settled down. And we put angle brackets in. It cost about £8,000. And that was really all we did. So actually, the, the story or the bit I really want to get to is actually this building had worked from 1580 through to 1950, and actually probably was okay at that point. So we haven't tried to do very much, we've just tried to help it along a little bit. And I think that's a really important thing to take away that actually you often don't need a lot. The scaffolding and everything else that had, we had went along with this obviously were hugely more expensive. And this is why he built the prospect room, to get the views out over the park. And there's the... Um, Picture room. It's one of those things as an engineer, we did some calculations to assess how stiff it was going to be, but it's only when you actually finish it and you get rid of everything that you know how well it's worked. And I'm actually convinced you could have an army up in there dancing and it would not move a job. So really satisfying. <laughs> and there we have on the outside. So I was just going to uh, uh, give you a few sort of concluding um, comments really. And I think the first thing I was going to say is almost anything is possible. Uh, given determination, actually a lot of what I do is common sense as well, um, but it is based on understanding, and that is understanding importance, significance, and actually how the structure is put together. 
And I think the last thing I wanted to say was just please, please, you know, challenge your engineers, make them think, and actually, you know, there are often ways, and most of you know robot, as I say, it's common sense, so do challenge them to come up with low impact, low cost solutions. Thank you.